as in a mirror, the history of civilization is reflected in our clothes. Now, it is more than the second skin, and fashion and style have become a way of self-expression. It is absolutely in style of the Kazakhs to see a deep symbolism, speak through things, objects, and rituals in material surrounding. Therefore, the history of national costume is a wonderful world, revealing our mentality. There is a certain type of clothing, the one you just need to look at, to immediately realize that only a person in power can wear it. Some of these garments are stored in museums, others are mentioned in historical chronicles. As for the modern outfits of the females in power, we see them on TV or on the Internet. Today we're going to talk about some blatant and inconspicuous tricks that were used and are being used in the production of such clothes. If you read books on the history of fashion or listen to some lectures about the costume traditions of different nations, you can reach an interesting conclusion. As a matter of fact, it was always people with sufficient funds, connections and free time who once became pioneer fashionistas. Among women, luxurious outfits could only be afforded by queens, leaders' wives, daughters and sisters, or representatives of the aristocratic elite. Since then, many things have changed. Today's smart and high-quality clothes are available to every single person. But then the question arises, what do influential people look like in the modern world? Some stylists borrow the concept of archetype, translated from Greek as the main model from psychology. This is a collective unconscious experience. Simply put, it's a concept of who or what one is dealing with. To describe the style of representatives of the authorities, specialists use the term the leader's archetype. Well, who are leaders? They are not only politicians, they can also be heads of organizations. As for the archetype of a leader, it can be a woman who is a prominent member of the society or a family, as well as a decision maker. In our particular case, there are so-called eminence Greece, our old ladies, who decide at weddings to whom and which chapon to give and where to sit guests at a restaurant. Um, Kazakhs have a word kimper for old lady, but there is also a word kariya, which means a well-respected woman in the family. Take a look at oriental miniatures or portraits of European monarchs. What colors prevail in their costumes? Usually it's deep and saturated shades of red, purple, navy blue, luxurious emerald, noble black and aristocratic white. The principle of only the best is still relevant when it comes to the costumes of influential women. Of course, the rulers always wore custom-made clothes, clothes with precise lines and cuts. A person in the status of ruler can afford expensive fabrics. A vertical color line is usually monochromatic, but the outfit in the whole is made in burgundy color, for example or navy blue. What is the usual cut for such clothes? These outfits are made tough and elastic, quite elastic. As for the details, a big color, of course. If there is a decolletage, it's usually quite modest. Gloves, white belt, cuffs. There might be a bow too, usually a rather big one. If there is a hat, then it's a hat with a wide brim. Also, rulers like to wear jabot and palazzo pants. Usually it was high-class people who could afford clothes with complex cuts, set in sleeves, for instance. This was all about precise lines. And how did the nomad nobility dress? In her works, the Kazakh historian Irina Yerofeyeva notes that in the 18th century, the ceremonial chapans of the Hans and Sultans wear various shades of red, sewn from velvet or cremoisine cloth. A little bit later, brocade clothes of various colors and more complicated cuts appeared in the wardrobe 
of the elite society members. Kazakh rulers wore white or red cone-shaped hats with silver fox fur trimming. This is what Han's outfits looked like, but what did female rulers wear? Unfortunately, travelers rarely mentioned this in their chronicles. The most interesting description was found in the writings of the 15th century Spanish diplomat Ruy González de Clavijo, who once visited the courtyard of the great Timur. The ceremonial appearance of Timur's first wife, Saraimul Khanum, and his other wives made an indelible impression on everyone. She was dressed in some incredible red silk robes embroidered with gold. And special attention was paid to her headwear in this description. Why that was the case? In the Eastern and particularly in nomadic culture, headwear was an integral attribute of the costume of a married woman. And of course, this was especially evident in costumes of the nobility. And since it was a ceremonial show, we can imagine that it was some absolutely unbelievable sight. The helmet-shaped headpiece was very high. It was decorated with a large number of precious stones, pearls, turquoise, rubies. The whole structure was crowned by a large plume of feathers, which were covering her face. It's interesting that further, Rui Gonzalez was saying that when she came out, 15 court ladies were carrying her train, and several others supported her headwear. Imagine what it looked like if so many aids were necessary. And when she and her retinue sat down, other wives came out, dressed just like her, but they all sat behind her. It was quite a show. It was a way to demonstrate how lavish the palace was. Foreigners who at different times visited Central Asia, Kazakhstan noted that noble women protected their face from tanning and covered it with whitening powder. In Europe, a pale face was also considered a sign of aristocracy. Specialists note another interesting feature of the outfits of female representatives of the royal elite. The thing is that during that period, during the reign of Timur, very interesting synthetic forms of the costume appeared in Central Asia. On the one hand, there were Mongolian traditions and clothing with some Chinese elements. The outfits had a great Chinese influence on them. On the other hand, there was a local Central Asian background with some elements of a Turkic nomadic costume. Also, this time, Western Iranian elements had a significant influence on the costume, especially the costume of the nobility. Thanks to the Great Silk Road, nomads had access to the best goods, technologies, and as people would say today, fashion trends. Corsets and jabot, the ones that the English Queen Elizabeth I wore, of course, would not be as popular among nomads. The step fashionistas tried to show off their lavish lifestyle with expensive fabrics, furs, gold, and precious stones. It was through the costume of the nobility that foreign ethnic elements were coming into fashion, because it was for the nobility that these products were most accessible, they were able to afford them, because obviously everything foreign was expensive. And of course, they were receiving certain garments as gifts. The jewelry, for instance, is certain clothing decorations. One can say that just like everyone else, the nomadic nobility was a conductor of new fashion trends. The wife of Hanjin Gir, the ruler of the Inabuki Ord, can also be considered as a trendsetter. In 1826, the royal couple was invited to the coronation of the Russian emperor, Nicholas I. Judging by the descriptions of her contemporaries, the Han Xiao made a pleasant impression on the court, with her outfits in particular. 
церемонии она присутствовала. She attended the ceremony wearing a more traditional costume, which was kind of a staged. Видимо, приветствовалась, потому что есть такое мнение о том, что это было... As it was a planned ceremony aimed to showcase the greatness of the Russian Empire. Впечатление величия Российской империи... So there were lots of subjects of the Russian Empire wearing their exotic national costumes. В своих необычайных экзотических костюмах. В то же время в At the same time she wore European clothes at the ball, so she was following European ball dress code. В европейской одежде, соответственно, европейской. To be fair, it's important to say that Fatima was the wife of the ruler, so she was considered as the first lady. She was the one setting fashion trends at home. Everyone would follow her lead. Fatima was quite an educated lady capable of supporting a conversation in Russian, French and German. It was mentioned in both Russian and European memoirs that she was a nice lady, educated, and she always looked comme il faut. Recently, the image of the ruler of the Masagetian tribe Tomris has become very popular in the creative circles. The female nomad ruler lived before the common era, so no one precisely knows how she looked like and what she wore. Kazakh filmmakers presented their own version of the life of the famous nomad. In the autumn of 2019, director Arhan Setaev presented the film Tomris. The main character's costumes were created by the talented costume designer Asil Shalabayeva. She suggested assigning a certain totem to each character. Depending on this, the image of the protagonist and the color palette of his costume were developed. For Tom Reese, a fox was chosen as a totem animal. Thus, in the final battle, for instance, Tom Reese was wearing a red costume. Main protagonists of the film belonged to the nobility. They were the daughters and wives of the leaders. I say his assistant, artist Dina Buksikova, worked on the image of Tomari's associate, Sardana. This was the daughter of the leader, the Amazonian queen, and her costume was supposed to reflect her high status. Her costume was more complex. There was more metal, her armor was heavier, she wore an expensive belt, expensive weapon, bracelets, and even her footwear was beautiful. Our consultant advised us to use more expensive fabrics in complex cuts if we wanted to highlight high status of a wearer. Also, he was telling us to use more jewelry. In fact, raids were their way of living. Also, there were some skillful craftsmen. They had silk and other expensive fabrics. They could simply get a hold of them in raids or just buy them. That's the way they made their costume look more expensive. The creative team was advised by historians, scholars Almaz Ordabayev and Kairat Begalin. It was the women's costumes that were the most challenging to create. Not so many relevant historical descriptions and archaeological findings made it to the present days. We did a lot of research trying to reconstruct the costume, and we tried to show and to find the specific cut, because the Saka costume is different from the Kazakh costume. Here in the sketch you can see the reconstruction we recreated. Natural fabrics were chosen to match the era as much as possible. The more beautiful the fur, the better, as it was a way of indicating the wearer's status. If we made the clothes of the leaders and their wives from expensive furs or the costumes of ordinary Masagetians, we used sheepskin. The footwear was different, too. Rich people's footwear featured beautiful embroidery. If you look at Tom Reese's footwear, you will see that it was embroidered. Some rich people even wore footwear with metal plates. Sometimes artists and costume designers had to try on the outfits they made in order to understand if those garments were following artistic design and to see whether they were comfortable enough. As the artist Dina Buksikova said, after such fitting they felt as if they time traveled. Many world leaders have a special relationship with fashion and style. Today, politicians and their spouses, as well as members of European royal families, are expected to wear domestic brands at public events. 
Georgian President Solomyos Robishvili wears Georgian silver coin pendants. The British politician Theresa May is a fan of the works of her compatriot, designer Vivienne Westwood. And the First Lady of France, Brigitte Macron, prefers Louis Vuitton. Sometimes it was the clothing that revealed the difference in mentality and taste of the ruling elite. In the 60s, a meeting between Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev and American President John F. Kennedy took place. The media were focusing their attention on the enormous difference between the costumes of the wives of politicians of two superpowers of the 20th century, Nina Khrushchev and Jacqueline Kennedy. Fashion is not as distant from politics as it may seem to many. For example, the fashion designer Sophie Fialette worked as Michelle Obama's stylist during Barack Obama's two presidential terms. However, she refused to dress Melania Trump, the wife of the next president of the White House. On social media, the fashion designer announced that she protests against the rhetoric of racism, sexism, and xenophobia unleashed by Melania's husband during his presidential campaign. So how does the First Lady of the United States manage to look her best with the help of new stylists? Melania Trump might not be a leader, but still she's quite an influential person. Everyone tries to follow what she looks like and what she wears at different events. Quite often she sports a sheath dress with puff sleeves. She's also very fond of palazzo pants, which are considered as an attribute of power. If we look at the picture where she poses next to Michelle Obama, we will notice that Michelle deliberately dressed following rulers' archetype standards. Next to her is Melania Trump, who is dressed in an outfit with a high fixed collar. But what about the other women leaders who, according to experts, look as good as their high status dictates? Of all influential women, I admire Motsa bint Nasir the most. She's magnificent. She always dresses elegantly with dignity. She's considered an icon of style and one of the most influential women in the Middle East. Well, what can we tell about her fashion looks? The most important thing is her headscarf. It's not a turban or veil. A headscarf is always tied neatly and beautifully. She usually wears clothes of saturated, deep colors. A headwear is quite big, bulky even. It adds to her poise and sense of importance. As for her makeup, it might appear a bit heavy and too colorful for her status, but since she has very expressive facial features, it looks fine. In her clothes, she tries to accentuate her shoulders. If we look at her pictures, we will notice an emphasis on her shoulders. She loves to sport large jewelry, to have vertical lines present in her outfits, color vertical lines. In her case, bigger accessories only emphasize her status. For example, if she chooses pink clothes, a pink or pastel suit, it won't be a plain pink blouse, it will be a garment with an elegant cut, wider at the bottom, made of a dense fabric. If we look at the photo featuring Mozart bin Nasser and the ex-queen of Spain, Sofia, we will notice certain archetype features. Shoulders are accentuated, her headwear is quite big, and her whole look is all about contrasts. When meeting with Queen Elizabeth, Malta bin Nasser opted for a red suit. Again, she chose monochromatic look. Her dress was in the shape of the trapezoid. Her skirt's fabric was firm and starched. And this French woman is in charge of all European money. Recently, Christine Lagarde was appointed president of the European Central Bank, and she indeed looks like she's a tailor-made for this job. For me, Christine Lagarde is the standard of a stylish woman, a female leader. The most distinctive feature is her noble gray hair. She doesn't try to dye it, on the contrary, it emphasizes her status. Here we see how the strongest contrast, black and white, is utilized. She's not afraid to wear these colors. 
Our outfit is plain, jacket fits perfectly. Our collarbone zone is not covered. An unbuttoned color, big details, accessories. She softens her coldness in appearance with accessories and scarves. She wears pearls and brushes. They work quite well for a portrait zone. In 2015, the president of the Republic of Kazakhstan, Nursultan Nazarbayev, was at a reception at Buckingham Palace. His daughter, politician and MP Dariga Nazarbayeva, accompanied him in his visit to the Queen Elizabeth II. When we talk about the Queen's archetype, there are certain marks that stand out. Plain beige suit, set on sleeves, and the fact that the suit fits like a glove tells us the woman is a ruler. As for Dariga Nazarbayeva, her clothing certainly bears some features of a female leader. She always wears perfectly fitting plain suit and a skirt. Skirts are higher in status than trousers. As for her suit, there feature certain things that highlight her status. A precise shoulder line, clear concise shapes, plain cuts, fabric density, set in sleeves. As for the bright shade of fuchsia, it certainly attracts attention, especially in the context of visiting to Buckingham Palace. And one certainly cannot forget about appearance. We must not forget that the Asian facial features are tolerant to bright colors. In the psychology of color, a bright shade of pink delivers the impression of youth, vitality and fun. In psychology, fuchsia color is considered provocative. So, it's recommended to combine it with neutral shades in order to fade it a little. The audience for the Queen is a special case. People try to match the required etiquette. But it's not always possible to combine one's personal style with a required dress coat. It's a great skill to be able to assimilate your inner self-image with a dress coat. People are not perfect, and even a high rank cannot protect one from fashion failures. In 2016, the English Queen received the Ambassador of Ukraine, Natalia Galiborenko. Many considered Ukrainian diplomats' choice of hat as a sign of bad taste, since the headwear looked like a big bow on her head. This fashion failure even encouraged the appearance of different memes on social media. But let's get back to the traditional Kazakh clothing. As you might know, certain signs and national clothes can help one to determine the social status of the wearer. By Bishé, the head of the clan, she could be seen from quite a distance. What was so special about her looks? In her silhouette, a large white kimishek was standing out. She was wearing a huge ring that emphasized her status. Rings were made of precious metals and were inlaid with large gemstones. And of course, fabrics of her clothing were reflecting her status as well. These were velvet, plush and a fur-trimmed chapon. And of course, her clothes would feature some exquisite embroidery. Kazakh women have long ago replaced their national costumes with urban outfits, often imported. So what kind of advice can stylists give to our domestic female leaders. A female boss in Kazakhstan, in my opinion, ought to look impressive. That's the requirement of our Asian appearances. She has to employ all available tools to emphasize her status, to highlight her appearance, and she mustn't forget about her feminine side too. Because day to day she works in the so-called male world. A female leader is supposed to use less resources and at the same time achieve greater success, goals and results. When choosing fabrics, one should opt for noble deep shades. It's advisable to find a good tailor who can make great tailor-made suits, the ones that will match their physique, their figure type, suits that can emphasize one's personality and merits. As you see, at all times, in all cultures, including the nomadic environment, 
the appearance of rulers' wives was a way of demonstrating their husband's status, as well as reflecting the power and wealth of the state, people, or tribe. Some of these costume traditions are fully intact today. Clothing is a business card that doesn't need to be pulled out of one's pocket, as it's always in sight. This is especially relevant for both politics and public life. I wonder what costumes of modern female rulers will pass the test of time. Nobody knows that, but we can always keep the tricks and secrets of their creation for ourselves.